He doesn't just come up with slick ideas on his own. There is no epistles without the gospels. Without the preaching of the kingdom, there is no church. It is the preaching of the kingdom that gives birth to the church. Let me say it like this. This is how my spiritual father says it. The church doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. We need to be possessed by mission. I believe that we're in, a, we're in a reformation. And I'm going to speak to that in a few minutes. But right now, and Moses and Elijah appeared talking with Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, it says that they were talking about his decease, what he would accomplish through his decease. None of the apostles wanted to, to recognize that Jesus was going to die. If you would continue to read 16, Jesus rebukes Peter and calls him Satan. And says, you savor the things of men. Why? Because Jesus was saying he was going to suffer and die. That didn't fit into Peter's eschatological understanding. Peter thought that uh, Isaiah 63 was going to happen before Isaiah 53. It didn't happen that way. Then answered Peter and said unto the Lord, is it good for us to be here if you will? Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he yet spoke, behold, the bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my well-beloved Son, in, in him I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and they were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. So when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, telling them the vision, to tell no man the vision, excuse me, until the Son of Man would be raised from the dead. Now, there's a lot here. The first thing is we are changed from glory to glory in the place of prayer. Jesus, as a leader, is taking three of his best friends and he's facilitating an encounter with God, an encounter that is in, in the realm of seeing and in the realm of hearing. One of the things leaders do is leaders facilitate other people to encounter God. They create an atmosphere and they create an environment and they create an opportunity for other people to come into contact with God. That's one of the things that leaders do. Anyway. So Moses and Elijah appear. Peter has a slick idea. The father was not so nuts about Peter's idea. It said that a cloud came and overshadowed them. You know what that word means in Greek? It literally means this. A cloud came and invested in them. Invest. That's the word. Invest. You don't believe me? Check the Strong's. Invest. And so the Father came, hovered over these guys, and the Father invested in them. When you feel the presence of God on the outside, you know what God is doing? He's investing in you. So that when you don't feel the presence of God, you can still release it. We walk by faith. We don't walk by feelings. I've seen some insane things happen and have not felt anything. And then I felt all the feelings in the world and seen nothing happen. We do not live by feelings. We live by faith. We walk by faith. Anyway, the Father says, This is my well-beloved Son. Hear Him. What's fascinating is the Father speaks audibly three times in the Gospels and there's only one command that He gives and the command is that we would hear His Son. That we would know and perceive and rightly and fully understand and discern 
His Son. The Father wants us to know, to understand, and to hear Jesus. That's His number one priority. This is the God of heaven and earth who knows everything. Nothing is hidden from Him. He's omniscient. He's literally found of people who are not looking for Him. Do, do you understand? And this God comes and manifests through a cloud and speaks. And His priority was that people would hear His Son. That's major. You know the Father is speaking to you and all you can see is Jesus. The other people disappeared. You know what fathers do? They remove distractions from sons. In the natural world, a father who sees his son going astray will come and will speak some things into him and remove the distractions so that the son can see clearly. As the heart of the father, is the heart of the father says, that's good, you're seeing this religious stuff, you're seeing visions, it's really great. You know what, I'm going to remove distraction from you because you're too immature to see what's happening and to understand it. Father is great at removing anything that distracts us from Jesus. I want to say to you in this time, do not be distracted. We need to stay focused. And we need to stay committed to the vision, to the mission. Now, you see, we're going to continue to talk about the rock. Watch this. In 1 Peter 2.8, it says, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. It's just very interesting here that you see again the rock. We are what? Living stones. Right? So this revelation that Peter had personally became what he wrote about. Our ministry is what God reveals to us. I cannot minister outside of revelation. I'm not going to come here and regurgitate someone else's message to you. I may reference it. I may say it was great. But in reality, our ministry is the thing that God reveals to us. Let's go to Hebrews 12. I want, I want to show you, I want to leave you with this, this last uh, thought, so to speak. I know it's getting late. It's not that late, though. I want to leave, maybe we'll go, we'll continue a little more. Who knows? I want to leave you, though. I want to put this thought fresh in your mind because, you see, we are living in a second and a better covenant. And if we're living with a better covenant, why do we expect insuperior results? That sounds like unbelief. We're living with a better covenant, okay? And we expect less from God. Often, we ask for less than what God has already provided in Christ. Anyway. Hebrews 12, we're going to start with verse 18. For ye are not unto the mount, okay. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. It's speaking of Sinai, which is in Saudi Arabia today, which just to let you know that the word of God is so true, they will not let anyone near that mountain. It's off limits. Okay, yes. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice that they in heard entreated them, the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Stop. I want to explain to you what this is talking about. What's happening is, remember when Moses was on the mountain? 
God said that he didn't want anyone else to come on the mountain. If they would come on the mountain, they would be dead. Are you with me? So what, what that is, is that's a man who is a mediator, an intercessor. He's communicating with God on behalf of a nation that rejected God's voice because they were afraid of it. They said, we're not interested. I wrote about this in Sitting at His Feet. They say, we're not interested in your voice. We're interested in the rules. Talk to us through Moses and we'll do what he says. The very encounter that they were afraid of was the thing that God was going to use to calibrate their hearts that they might obey Him. It's always that we're always empowered to obey through an encounter. And the thing that they were afraid of is the thing that God was releasing to them that was to equip them. Okay? So they're on this mountain. Are you with me? And they cannot go on the mountain. So you have, and you know, a lot of churches now are like this, you know, today. The pastor is basically Moses. He goes up to the mountain, and Sunday morning he brings down what he got on the mountain. But that's not New Testament. New Testament is let us go and boldly approach the throne, the throne of grace. Let us, not let me. Not let the man of God, not let the bishop, not let the pastor, but let us. Good leadership, again, facilitates people encountering God. That's part of what a healthy leadership does. All right? And so anywhere who gets near this mountain is going to die. Does that make sense? Watch this. <laughs> Everything changes. But ye, <laughs> or you, but you are come unto a Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, a heavenly Jerusalem, and unto innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, and to the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, and the blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse him not that speaks. For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. He's talking to the people of God and saying, do not turn a deaf ear to the voice of God. Whose voice then, watch this, he's talking now, look whose voice he's talking about. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Why? Because it's a rock or a stone that became a mountain that is going to fill the earth. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and, and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Grace is the empowering presence that allows us to serve God and to fear Him and to serve Him in a way that is acceptable to Him. Anytime we are serving God in a way that is acceptable to Him, it will always be beneficial to others. If we are serving God and it is acceptable to Him, that means it is beneficial for others. That means our motives and our intentions are clean and they're, and, and they're pure. And when our motives are pure, other people benefit from our pure motives. Yes. That makes sense? But see, what I love about this, this verse is if you go back to verse 22, it's, it, it talks about like, have you ever heard people say the good old days? But, you know, it's like almost like the writer of Hebrews is saying, the good old days weren't that good. <laughs> they refused God and he was going to strike them dead on a mountain for wanting to communicate with him. Wanting to like, you know... Being inquisitive about like what's happening on this mountain, yeah. you know, 
We are living in a better covenant. I mean, it says that we have come. I mean, is this true? It says, again, but ye, he's talking to the Hebrews, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God. <laughs> do, do you understand? He was saying those people couldn't come, but you have come. Not you will come. Not you'll get sucked up in a cloud one day, and then you'll be there in the sweet by and by. It says, but you have come. Come to the city of the living God. You see, religion pushes what God wants to do in the present into the future. But revelation leaves us with a responsibility in the present so that the kingdom would increase in the future as we move forward with God. Of the increase in his government and peace, there will be no end. See, even, even the end of the age, we need to rethink how we believe about the end. Because the end is a removal of things which should not be there. Who, who, who do the angels gather at the end? The wicked. And throw them off the planet where? Where? into the lake of fire. Where are the just? Where are the righteous? They inherit what? Who do the meek inherit? The kingdom. But it actually says the earth. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. The city of God is going to descend upon where? The earth. The wicked are going to be removed from the earth. So what's happening, even in, this is inconceivable, when Jesus was hanging on a tree, bleeding naked, his kingdom was increasing. Amen. When the end of the eight, when God judges, his kingdom is increasing. When people are persecuted and thrown in prison and beat and spit on and mocked and tortured... His lordship in them is growing up and his kingdom is increasing. Do, do you understand? See, it's very inconceivable. Sometimes when we take up a victim mentality, we become blind to what God's doing. God has started something through Jesus coming and ascending that cannot be revoked and it cannot be stopped. Am I saying all people will be saved? No. Because if all people would be saved, then the angels wouldn't have to gather the wicked. But I am saying that we are victorious because of what Jesus has done. We are more than conquerors through him who conquered death. We, are, we have received the spirit of adoption and our heart cries, Abba, Father, and fear is removed. And by faith, we enter into all that God has promised and said that is ours, that has prov been provided on a tree. Everything we receive in the kingdom has been provided by, by Christ who hung on a tree. The merchant man, I had a friend of mine, he's a wealthy guy, and he would read the merchant man who sold everything to get the pearl. And he would get scared. He'd read this and go, you know, very wealthy guy. He'd be like, man, you know, I, I read this verse and I get scared that like I have to sell everything. And I, I looked at him and I said, all the money you got can't buy the kingdom of God. That ain't about you. It's about Jesus who sold all that he can, you know, all that he got, all that he had, and he freely gave himself for the pearl of great price. Proverbs 31, her worth is far above rubies. That's also the word pearl. Speaking of a bride that he paid for. The parables are about him. They're about his kingdom. Let, let, let's, let me go to one more. Because let's, let's translate this into real life. Let's not make this religious. Right? Let's not just make this theological. Let's not just make this revelatory. Let's make this real. 
Matthew 13, 31. Another parable he spoke to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed into the field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Do you understand what this is saying? Let me explain to you who he's talking to. He's speaking to Jewish people who are under Roman occupation who have a very small amount of land. No person in their right mind would put mustard seed on their land because you can't eat anything from it. This is an agricultural society that only lives on the land. They don't eat processed food. There is no processed food. That's why they live longer. Do you understand? And so what happens is, what Jesus is saying here is illogical. It doesn't make any sense. Zero. He's saying the kingdom is like someone planting a mustard seed in their, in their, in their, in their, in their ground. You know, you got to think. Here's Jews. They're taxed. They don't have much. They're under Roman occupation and they have a very small amount of land. And Jesus is telling them that the kingdom of God is like someone who sows seed, a seed that is really worthless, doesn't produce any food or fruit. Hello, are you listening to me? And what this seed does is it starts out small and it creates a safe haven for birds, for unclean animals. The kingdom of God is sown into the realm of the earth and it makes a refuge for Gentiles. The people that are oppressing you, the people that you hate, Jesus was saying, the kingdom is for them too. The kingdom is a place of refuge for unclean birds. The kingdom is a place for strange birds. Now, I know there's some strange birds in church, but there's some in the kingdom too. Is that okay to say that? <laughs> All right, watch this. But see, what, what, what I'm saying is, see, it, it's the same concept as that... He says, I went to prepare a place for you. What is he saying? He's saying to the disciples, there's room for you in the kingdom. What is he saying to the Gentiles? To the Jews, but about the Gentiles. There's room for them in the kingdom. Yes, you guys are prejudiced. And you want me to liberate you from them, but I want to liberate you from you. But, but what I want you to see is that this seed is something that literally takes over. And the point of takeover is to serve and to be a refuge for others. Does that make sense? The point of, of resources is to serve. The point of this seed that grows up and becomes great is it's only great because it makes room for people. Yes. That's why it's great. Jesus. Translate that into your life. The kingdom of God is sown into wildwood and there's room for the homeless. There's room for the hungry. There's room for the poor. That's why it's essential that you believe the things that God has said to you and you do them so that you prosper. Because according to God, the government doesn't owe them anything. We do. Amen. Watch this. 1333, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Again, he's saying stuff that is absolutely bogus. Do you understand the Jews had a feast of unleavened bread? I mean, their goal was to get all of the leaven 
out of their house. This is nuts. Do, do, do you understand how nuts this is? Do you, do you understand that they literally spent time getting everything that was leavened out of their house? They spent time cooking things that were without leaven. They journeyed to have a feast about it. I mean, it really meant something to them. And Jesus takes their sacred cow and lights it on fire and said, let me, let me explain to you something about the kingdom of God. It's kind of like the leaven that you've been taught to get out of your house because it contaminates. He said, no, 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 no. The kingdom, the woman that sows it, you know who she is? She's the church. And she sows the kingdom into the world until it until it grows. And you know how it grows when it's put in the oven. Yeah. It's interesting how Jesus comes from a very, very, he comes at them almost sideways. He comes at them in such a way that if the Father is not revealing this to them, they're not going to get it. And he comes, but, but what's so interesting here is that the, the, with the leaven and, and with, with the mustard seed, when it's speaking of what the kingdom is like, it's really saying the kingdom is a dominant force that when it starts, it only ends when it accomplishes its task. And I think that the church needs, I think we need to be more mission oriented.